This is NJTV. From the production studios of Montclair State University, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. A death knell for the bridge investigation, low grades for highways, free breakfast for school kids, and college credit for life experience, tonight on NJTV News. Hello, I'm Mary Alice Williams. Reports that federal charges are now ruled out for Chris Christie in the affair that came to be known as Bridgegate are apparently not true. A spokesman for U.S. Attorney Paul Fishman's office says the investigation is ongoing, that they're actively working the case. But the false report had Republican legislators and even some Democrats echoing the governor's plea that legislators investigating last year's politically motivated lane closings on the bridge just wrap it up. David Cruz reports. We don't know if Chris Christie knew about the report citing unnamed sources at the U.S. Attorney's Office, but the governor chose coincidentally perhaps yesterday to unleash his most personal and aggressive attack on the legislative committee looking into the GWB scandal and the leaks coming from the panel. This is Assemblyman Wisniewski and the leadership of that committee. They care more about being on television than they care about actually getting to the truth and being on the front page of the newspaper. And I'm tired of it. I really am. Did you feel a sense that it, this was a very personal? I was crushed. <laughs> Chairman Wisniewski says the governor has been hypocritical about leaks to the press, but she says Christie doesn't seem to mind when the story favors him. Wisniewski accuses the governor of hiding behind executive privilege when it comes to turning over certain documents to the investigative committee and then accusing the committee of not cooperating. Look, he doesn't want to have this discussion because this is a very embarrassing situation for him. I mean, it really is embarrassing for his leadership style. It's embarrassing that the people he's entrusted have done these things. Uh, and there are unanswered questions about who knew what when. But this week, the committee's attorney sent members a letter warning them about the leaks. Committee member Assemblywoman Holly Shapizzi says she's been frustrated by the committee's work, or lack thereof, for months. We are legislators. How is it that New York State, the Assembly and the Senate, and in New Jersey, the Senate have managed to unanimously put forth reform initiatives. And here we are in the Assembly saying, okay, well, we'll have up for discussion only purposes some of the stuff. It's absurd. Wisniewski says reform legislation is only part of the committee's mission. He says they plan to call more witnesses and issue more subpoenas. Asked about reports that he was getting pressure from Senate President Steve Sweeney, a potential gubernatorial candidate, to wrap up the committee's work, Wisniewski, also a potential gubernatorial candidate, said that that was nothing more than the Trenton echo chamber. People hear things, people think they hear things, and then they repeat them. I have not gotten any pressure from anybody to wrap this up, and I think that's a sensible statement because we're not done. I am not going to permit them when they conduct themselves in such an irresponsible way to, you know, have an unfettered access to this office just so they can use themselves as a highway to the media. So, you know, if he's got some complaints, he knows what to do. Chairman Wisniewski says he won't put a time clock on his committee's work, regardless of what schedule works best for the governor or, for that matter, his own party's leadership. For NJTV News, I'm David Cruz. The safety record at Mountain Creek's water park is better. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Vernon, where reports of 110 accidents in 1985, some of them fatal, gave the old action park such notoriety, locals called it Traction Park. In 96, the owners abandoned the name altogether. It reopened this summer with the old name and new safety precautions. So there were only 26 minor injuries this year. In every analysis of New Jersey amusement park accidents, Mountain Creek always tops the list. Experts say that's because water slides have more variables than roller coasters. So ride the 45-foot ski jump slick drop kick that slams you into an airbag 
at your own risk. Next to Haddonfield, losing a treasure. James Spinelli was 11 years old when he was recruited off a Camden sidewalk by a cobbler in need of an apprentice. He's been saving souls ever since. Now at 94, he's closing up shop. His machines, the sander and trimmer and nailer, nearly as old as he is, were picked up today by a New York garment company for spare parts. The Quaker Shoe Repair Building, where he's lived above his shop, was built 200 years ago and is showing its age too. Mr. Spinelli was a retiring soul before retirement, so he's been surprised at the outpouring of affection from customers. Now he's looking for an apprentice to take care of them all, but his are big shoes to fill. Finally, to Jersey City, where fashionistas are gearing up to give New York Fashion Week a run for its money. The hosts, a pantheon of reality TV runway show celebrities. The models, more than 100 who call Jersey home. The emerging designers, more than 30 local talents who will be pushing the boundaries of fabrication, draping, and edginess. The look, leather, lace, bright colors, and floral prints for working women, a few chains to lend moody ambiguity, and neon tutus bedecked with feathers by one awesome eight-year-old. Take that, New York. And that's our Garden State Express for Friday, September 19th. Something up where you live? Let us know. Major funding for NJTV News provided in part by New Jersey Manufacturers, Auto Insurance and more for New Jersey Business and Industry Association members and their employees. New Jersey Association of Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njar.com. Verizon, communication solutions designed for the people and businesses of New Jersey. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. Wells Fargo, together we'll go far. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. The Star Ledger and NJ.com. Barnabas Health, life is better healthy. Online at BarnabasHealth.org. And PSENG, serving customers, strengthening the business community, and investing in New Jersey's future. New Jersey families with developmentally disabled loved ones have, in the past, arranged for the state to pay institutions in other states to care for unique cases. Now the state wants to keep its funding here, so it's bringing them back home where resources are slim. Brenda Flanagan reports on one instance where the Return Home New Jersey program went wrong. 22-year-old Tyler Loftus looked lost at his arraignment in Superior Court. Diagnosed autistic, bipolar, with the mind of a five-year-old, Tyler's charged with making terroristic threats and unlawful possession of a weapon, a three-inch pocket knife. Have you received a copy of the charges against you? Complaint? I don't know, sir. His mom, Rita O'Grady, spoke for her bewildered son. He's had no day programs or psychiatric supports. How'd he end up here? Let's rewind. 18 months ago, Tyler lived at the Woods School in Pennsylvania, where for the prior seven years, he'd received psychiatric therapy along with other developmentally disabled patients. But the Return Home New Jersey program moved Tyler to this group home in rural Franklin Township, where the staff could not control him and were not allowed to use restraints. A routine day is him giving them a hard time, usually results in a 911 call. The state police respond, uh, take him to the emergency room for an evaluation. This happens at least five times a week, and sometimes it happens more than once in a day. She says the local hospital can't keep him. There was a case manager over there named Mike who said, we can't, we're not Tyler's staff. We can't be his staff every day. So Tyler again goes back to the group home for a year and a half. His mother says she's begged the state DDD, the Division of Developmental Disabilities, to find a place that offers psychiatric treatment and security. 
They just keep telling me that we're investigating a possible program. Meeting after meeting after meeting, I hear the same thing, but there's never any action on their part. The DDD said it could not comment. Tyler's mom said psychiatric reports note her son routinely threatens to hurt or kill those around him when he's stressed and also has an interest in knives and weapons. She says he hasn't hurt anyone yet, but this week police charged him with threatening a roommate. By holding a three-inch pocket knife, in the open position above his head and threatening to slash his throat if he did not back off. Tyler's one of 150 developmentally disabled clients already brought back via the Return Home New Jersey program with hundreds more scheduled to return to what their families fear are uncertain circumstances. They lobbied and got a bill passed to put a moratorium on Return Home New Jersey, but Governor Christie vetoed it. Today in court, they offered moral support and the judge continued the case. Jail is not an option and that's we're, that's what's happening because we're not getting the supports that we need. By the judge's order, Tyler Loftus will be spending the next few weeks at a state-run psychiatric hospital where he will be evaluated and hopefully officials will figure out what to do with him. In Flemington, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. New census figures show that nationwide poverty rates dropped for the first time since 2006. But not here. New Jersey was one of only three states where more people were living in poverty. New Jersey Policy Perspective reports the number of people on food stamps, stamps is up. So is the number of foreclosures. At least a third of households are struggling to meet basic needs. Now, 32 school districts qualify to provide not just free lunches to low-income students, but free breakfast, too. Brianna Venosi reports. No one's fumbling around for money or pulling out a brown paper bag in this cafeteria. Every single student at Malcolm X Shabazz High School in Newark receives a free meal. This new program eliminates the, the need to fill out any applications or for parents to divulge any income guidelines or anything like that. So all kids can eat breakfast and lunch for free. 32 school districts around the state are using a provision in the federal Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. It subsidizes the two free meals for all students, regardless of their family's income level. According to the Department of Agriculture, which oversees the program, schools must have very high percentages of students certified eligible for free meals through other federal assistance programs. Eligible schools will choose to participate only if it's financially viable for them. So I believe that percentage of these kids that take advantage of this probably this is the healthiest meal that they're going to get throughout the day. 19 Newark schools are eligible, which means over 40% of students are identified as in need. No. We noticed that, you know, kids were coming to school, to classrooms, hungry. They were always asking, so when is lunchtime? In Patterson, School 15's principal says they serve breakfast in the classroom after the morning bell to make sure everyone eats. One of the problems that I saw, especially with breakfast, is that we served breakfast at 7.45 in the morning. And sometimes our parents couldn't bring the children at 7.45 in the morning. A lot of our kids had tardiness problems. Participating schools are reimbursed with federal money. For a district like Patterson, where the food budget tops $5 million, every school qualifies, all 29,000 students. Students are focusing more on the instruction, on the learning. They're not asking when is lunchtime. Um, they seem to be more attentive, doing more work. Talk to officials within the district and they'll tell you that this free meal program is not just about providing students with something nutritious to eat during the day. It also increases the chances that they'll show up for school and that they'll show up on time. Most kids coming to school eating breakfast, the less kids you have taking time off, being absent or being tardy. The Department of Agriculture expects more eligible districts will be rolling out the program in the next school year. For NJTV News, I'm Brianna Venosi. Governor Christie said he doesn't like tax amnesties, even though the last one raised a quick $725 million before he was governor. But with a nearly $3 million budget gap, the state's credit rating downgraded a record eight times and an economic collapse in Atlantic City. Christie's announced what he says is not a tax amnesty, but it sounds like one. Here's Lauren Wonko. 
Some taxpayers are getting a break, an offer of reduced or eliminated penalties for those with outstanding tax bills who pay up within the next two months and no costs of collection and no recovery fees. It's the first initiative of its kind under the Christie administration. This is really fascinating because the governor has said he's against amnesty. He's against giving anybody who hasn't paid their taxes any break at all. This is obviously a break, whether you call it an amnesty or not. A Treasury Department spokesperson tells NJTV News it's not an amnesty because, among other things, penalties are waived, but interest is not. It really is kind of a bit of a shell game with the semantics, but at the end of the day, it's all about, I need money to balance the next budget. We asked the Treasury Department why the tax offer is being rolled out now. We're always looking for more efficient and quicker ways to settle accounts with taxpayers, says a spokesperson. As we have moved away from peak tax processing season, the division has more resources to devote to this initiative now. But Monmouth University's Patrick Murray says it's really about Governor Christie's 2016 presidential run and ensuring he's able to balance next year's budget with as little pain as possible. The governor probably has one more uh, budget that he, he needs to get passed without a lot of controversy uh, before he runs for president. I think it's a great initiative because people, due to circumstances that they encounter in life, just get behind on taxes. Tax attorney and CPA Archini says it's a win-win for his clients and the state. Basically, the, the state has a lot of money sitting out there that it's not collecting. So this is a way for them to get some of that money, and it's significant. The Treasury Department doesn't have any estimates on how much the tax offer might raise. Accounting professor Doug Stives calls the action a good business decision, one that's brought in millions under previous administrations and in other states. Do they need the money? Absolutely. Is that why they did it? No, it's a business decision. Because remember, it costs the state millions of dollars to collect money. They have to pay people to go out. And this way, the money's just going to roll in through a website. It's pretty clever. At the end of the day, Every dollar counts. Everything's on the table to get as much money into the coffers as possible. So I don't think that this is the last turnaround that we're going to see on revenues, as long as we don't call them revenue raisers. The offer is open to both businesses and individuals who have outstanding tax liabilities for the tax periods 2005 through 2013. The initiative runs through November 17th. I'm Lauren Wonko and JTV News. Even though the Transportation Trust Fund is drying up, the state spent more than $2 million a mile to improve road conditions. So it might come as a surprise that a national survey of state highways ranks New Jersey near the bottom, beating out only Alaska and Hawaii. Here's Christy Duffy. $2 million for every mile of roadway. That's the cost of our state-run roads, according to a new report by the nonprofit Reason Foundation. We, our roads, for the amount of money that we spend on them, are horrendous. Where does the figure come from? The report crunched data provided by the state to federal agencies. Money spent on state roads in 2012 totals $6 billion. Divide that by about 3,300, the length of the parkway, turnpike, and other state roads, and the report's authors came up with $2 million per mile. A DOT spokesman tell us the numbers do not account for how wide our roads stretch. The report ranks New Jersey at the very bottom for highway performance. We particularly suffer when it comes to how we spend our transit dollars, say the findings. New Jersey state roads are saddled with debt. In fact, the state is spending nearly a million dollars a year on just interest. Federal figures show that's more than every other state except Texas. Paying off interest is on par with how much is spent on maintenance, administration research and planning, law enforcement and safety combined. The report says we do have among the safest roads in the nation. While on our bridges and rural roads, findings show conditions are mediocre at best. According to the report, 25% of New Jersey bridges are structurally deficient or functionally obsolete. Overall, the Reason Foundation says our road conditions have been declining consistently over a period of three years. So all of these numbers are worse than the national averages and uh, don't reflect the significant funds that the state has available to to manage the program. Yesterday, Governor Christie nominated former State Transportation Commissioner Jamie Foxx to his old job. And I look forward to starting as soon as possible at the Department of Transportation. I'm very hopeful because, A, one, he's of the uh, op uh, opposing uh, 
party, political party, he's a Democrat, whereas Christie is a Republican, I feel that's a, a good start because he could put someone who they, if they could come upon a plan, he'll know that it's a bipartisan plan. So will the new transportation chief be able to turn this situation around? The DOT declined any interviews with us today. The commissioner's confirmation is pending in the state legislature. In Woodbridge, I'm Christy Duffy for NJTV News. No college diploma, no luck. A new report from a labor analytics firm, Burning Glass, found that many employers require college degrees now for jobs they used to fill with high school graduates. They're calling it credential inflation. But for people with neither the time nor money for a four-year college, some New Jersey schools are offering something radical. College credit for life experience, Candace Kelly reports. Demonstrate what you know and receive college credit. That's the philosophy behind New Jersey Prior Learning Assessment Network, or NJ Plan. People are always learning. Adults are always acquiring new knowledge. It doesn't have to happen inside the ivory tower for it to be something that's valid and useful. Thomas Edison State College is already a national leader in the use of assessing prior experience. The college now anchors NJ Plan for schools interested in offering the same assessments, including NJIT, where staff is being taught how to attract students, especially for manufacturing jobs. Manufacturing is an incredible economic driver for our economy. For every one job in manufacturing, there are five other jobs created. Rowan University, Essex County College, and New Jersey City University are also part of this pilot program. What um, higher ed is really recognizing now is that there are so many students out there, uh, so many potential students who um, need a degree in order to move up in the workforce or just for the sense of personal satisfaction. Students can prove what they know in any major by taking an exam or preparing a portfolio. Those papers and portfolios are reviewed by trained college assessors. According to national reports, about one million people in New Jersey have partial degrees, and supporters of NJ Plan say that the program helps those adults, members of the military, and more non-traditional students. And going through the program is often faster and cheaper than paying tuition to attend a class. Uh, we're not really giving them any instruction. We're asking them to document what they already know. Some critics say it's not fair to give credits for classes students don't sit through. But supporters say if students have already mastered the class, why teach them again? And here is a rigorous process which helps them demonstrate what they know. If students can demonstrate they know the course material, they're one step closer to an undergraduate or master's degree. In Newark, Candace Kelly, NJTV News. Buying something sight unseen, that used to be called a pig and a poke, but this one's a peach of a play with a well-known star, the dad on Wonder Years, who's also the playwright. Dan Loria has a hit before the curtain even opens. Maddie Orton reports from one New Jersey theater that gives new work a proper send-up. Susan Early and Joan Aboff are Long Branch neighbors out for a night at the theater. They never know what they're in for with New Jersey Repertory Company, but they take the gamble. In fact, they're seasoned subscribers. It's part of the adventure. You don't know what's coming, and it's always kind of fun. NJ Rep only stages new plays. That means shows that audiences are wholly unfamiliar with. So how do you market an unknown product? We're always starting from the ground up. There is no history to that play. Uh, people can't associate it with having it having been on Broadway or off-Broadway. And then what often happens is word of mouth begins to catapult the play. Gabor Barabas is the company's executive producer. Though he calls presenting unknown works probably the least pragmatic thing you could do, he believes it's important. And Barabas is in good company. Dan Laurie is best known for his work as Dad Jack Arnold on The Wonder Years. But here, he's both playwright of and performer in their current production, 
dinner with the boys. It's our culture. It's our history. We don't have enough theaters that allow writers to develop plays. And Loria says the idea that audiences don't want to take a risk is just wrong. Uh, there was an old timer in Miami once said we read it. We said something about old people don't want to see new plays. And he got very upset. He goes, I was there when Willie Loman first walked on the stage. I was there when Tennessee Williams had his first production of Streetcar. What makes you think I don't want to see a good play? Charlie did most of the work. He has a green thumb. <laughs> that right, Charlie? You got a green thumb? <laughs> <laughs> Barabas never knows where the next good play will come from. The company receives hundreds of scripts a year, and though it may take a while, they read over all of them. We want to make sure we don't miss the next Tennessee Williams or Eugene O'Neill. So do audiences and actors. Ray Abruzzo may be best known as Little Carmine in The Sopranos, and Richard Zavaglia has numerous film and Broadway credits. If you do television, you do films, you don't get a chance to really actually be as creative yeah. as we've gotten to be in this particular process. That's a unique situation, so that's why we're, we're doing this, because mm -hmm. we're not doing it for the uh, right. money. <laughs> sometimes, they say there's a, an expression, sometimes for the yucks and sometimes for the bucks. <laughs> this is, this this is, is for the yucks. The yucks. <laughs> no, no, no. For the first time in the company's 17-year history, audiences are being asked to keep the yucks to themselves. Dinner with the Boys sold out before it even opened. Barabas hopes instead word of mouth will lead people to their waiting list as well as to future shows. After all, you never know what you'll get. In Long Branch, I'm Maddie Orton for NJTV News. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. Have a happy weekend. Every day, New Jersey realtors help residents navigate the complicated steps of buying or selling a home and achieve the American dream. But beyond that, we are your neighbors, working with you to build better communities and to increase housing opportunities for everyone. I'm Cindy Marsh Tishy, president of the New Jersey Association of Realtors. Learn more at NJAR.com.